Donc, euh, we'll be live in a second, one second. Facebook page. Yes, we are live. All right. Okay. Let me go back to the screen so I can see y'all. Lorraine, you're still not on? Nope. You're still not on. Okay. Um, one second, everybody. I'm just sharing the show on to the other pages. Here we go. Share. Group. Group of politics. Yeah. Okay, so you can go to my Facebook page and you can share it to your page. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, it's live. So so the people, your know, people can watch it as well. You can share it to your page. Okay. Um, Let me just. Go to a page, Black Russia Magazine page. Okay. So we are live. We are live. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> this is Black Westchester Presents. Oh, oh, I got audio on. Something. Hold on. There we go. This is Black Lives Matter presents the People Before Politics radio show. I am your host, AJ Woodson. Um, this is episode 261. We are still doing, um, Lorraine, you're not, your audio is not set up at all. I still don't have you as far as audio. Um, we are still doing the coronavirus uh, check-in situation. We're not back in the studio yet. Um, um, you know, it comes with is a little uh, technical difficulties, but um, we're gonna get right into it. I usually do a little intro and stuff, but I started late. Today, our guest is New York 17 congressional candidate, Catherine Parker. Um, this is where in the studio, I have a button where I push for applause. We don't have that. So <laughs> would, you would normally hear a round of applause right about now. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you, AJ. I'm really glad to be here with you and Lorraine. If, if Lorraine can can get her audio up and going, it'll be great. Um, so Doc, Dr. Bob's not going to be on today. Damon may be, to, may be um, signing in eventually. Um, I know he works night, so he might not be up right now. He works uh, corrections. He works the midnight shift. Yep. And Lorraine is having audio problems, so we're going to try to get her on. You can see her on the screen. I think she's frozen. We're going to try to get her on. Um, hopefully the technical difficulties will iron themselves out. But right now it's just me and Catherine and we're gonna have a conversation. So I interview for everybody, just catching everybody up. If this is your first time watching the show, we tried to get as many of the candidates on. So um, do a little one hour interview. Hopefully you, the viewer, will be more informed on the candidates when you go to the ballot box or you mail in your, your, your um, absentee ballot this year. Um, we've interviewed several candidates in this um, district. Asha Castle, Asha Castleberry Hernandez, my dear Jones. We just did Evelyn Farkas um, two weeks ago. And as promised, we rescheduled Allison Fine. And we have Adam, I do not remember his last name, and David Buckwalt uh, set up coming up soon. So, um, first things first, I wanted to ask you now you technically live and have served and have a business in the 16th congressional district, which is Elliot Engel's seat, mm -hmm. what made you, now I read your answers, I read the ride, the ride paper <laughs> and all in the low hood, but what made you run, decide to run for the 17th congressional district? Sure. So Nita Lowy has been in office for like 32 years and right. 23 out of those 32 years, mm -hmm. the community that I live in was in her congressional district. Okay. And so a judge made the decision at the last, after the last um, uh, census when they were doing reapportionment to stop the line. It goes all the way across Westchester, right to the very, almost till you get 
to the coast where I am on the, sh on the Sound Shore. It stops before Rye. I can literally walk my dog to the district. That's how mm -hmm. close we are. And out of all the candidates, I probably live closest to Nita Lowy herself. Um, in fact, her mailing address is Rye, though she technically lives in Harrison. Uh, and then, you know, as you mentioned, I'm a, a county legislator and I uh, served as majority leader in the last term. And I've worked on a lot of policy for Westchester County. So I've helped communities that are in the congressional district. And in fact, when I was chairing the environment committee, I was working on policy for the whole Hudson Valley region pertaining to Indian Point and then pertaining to the cleanup of um, the General Electric plant, which um, at that point in time there we were advocating to um, federal and state officials to have the, the continue the cleanup of the Hudson River. So really I was even helping Rockland County at that time, though working as a Westchester County legislator. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I was trying to fix Lorraine's problem, but I'm not gonna be able to do that. I was gonna remove her, but if I do, she can't join back in. So, so okay, so you have been, you served six years in the Mount Kisco City Council? Is it Mount um, the Rye City Council. Rye, Rye City Council, and then you six years as a county legislator. Right, I'm in um, my seventh year as a county legislator in my fourth term. Okay, so what made you decide to, um, Move up uh, uh, yeah. to the congressional seat. Sure. So my whole uh, career as an elected official, as I say, so this would be my 13th year as an elected official. And I really came into office with the thought that I wanted to make a difference um, uh, when it comes to the environment and climate change. And I've worked on a lot of environmental policy. I created the Office of Sustainability for Westchester County and the position of Energy Director for Westchester County and um, passed resolution uh, early on as a county legislator to get uh, Westchester to be a climate smart community. So all of that being said, um, there are limitations at the local level that I think a lot of, well, as you can see in this race, considering that there are three of us that are elected officials, I think all of us who work on policy for a given area, region, you know, we all recognize that at the federal government, there is so much more that could be done mm -hmm. to, to help. So when, you know, talking about an environmental policy, we know that um, certainly with some of the people that we have in Congress right now who have proposed a Green New Deal, which is a wonderful mission statement on what to do about climate change, that that's a great first step and certainly would, would help um, with uh, directing policy decisions for the entire nation and also as a as a partner with other countries you know we can we would set um, set the stage there and so so that certainly is is I think the the one of the, the major reasons why I wanted to get in this race um, and I also had felt that the other issue where I had worked on a lot of policy locally has been, um, you know, helping, you know, government is actually a, a tool for good. And mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that going back to the time of Ronald Reagan, when he said the scariest words that you could hear um, is I'm the government and I'm here to help you. You know, the mm -hmm. government's taken for 40 years, a PR campaign orchestrated by administrations that have really placed doubt in the ability for government to help. And they did that because they wanted to kind of take the eye, you know, the public's eye off of what they were really doing, which was helping the wealthy build more wealth, um, relaxing corporate uh, and banking regulations, and really allowing this oligarchy to be created. And so on the, my end of things, I've seen Westchester where we have 10% of our population living at or below the poverty line. And most of those are women and children. And I know of the work that we need to do as a local government to help um, help those that, that need the government to step in as a social safety net. And this has been an area of frustration to me also in recognizing that the federal government 
has an opportunity to really impact and change things so much greater than what we can do on the local level. So that was also one of the reasons why I felt like this was a race that I wanted to get in. And I think the lines are gonna be, you know, going back to your first question, I, I see that it's it could be just as likely that Rye ends up being back in the 17th congressional district as staying in the 16th district over the next reapportionment, which is gonna be happening after we do the 2020 census. So reapportionment right. will happen in 2021. And uh, and I think that, you know, there's no question my own community could end up there, but I've also put it out to folks in the, sixth, the 17th congressional district and particularly for folks in Rockland County who feel that they've been sort of the stepchild in the district that uh, I'm open to moving to Rockland County and being part of their community so that they can see and I can be, you know, boots on the ground and really see what's happening there and um, make sure that they they feel like they, their their needs are getting met. Now, a quick, real fast, I had a couple of quick questions. Um, first off, and, and let me ask you this briefly. You mentioned that um, you're one of the three candidates that is already an elected official. Um, why would that be important? Why is that important? Um, well, I think experience counts, and particularly now. I mean, we're seeing with this pandemic, having somebody in the White House that has no idea what he's doing, people in his administration that have no experience, no idea what they're doing, and we're seeing, more, you know, first firsthand watching this train wreck happen around coronavirus, that we really need people on the ground who understand the job of an elected official, the constituent services, really taking care of people. And no, no time is more important than right now. And though there are, there are one or two other people in this race that like to claim that they have you know, federal experience, they don't have the experience of a legislator. And the, the really, you know, what goes into making policy is more than just drafting uh, legislation. It's also in, in building relationships with people and working with people to get things done. I mentioned earlier uh, that I had passed the um, legislation that created an Office of Sustainability and an Energy Director position. I did that in a time when, um, you know, as a Democrat, when I was in the minority party in Westchester County government. I did that when we had a Republican County uh, executive and I did that in a way where I worked, you know, across the aisle to to get things done. So I know how that how that works, and I can do that, and I've demonstrated that. And I really think, you know, again, for for people that are making the decision for this race, they're seeing that those of us that have been in office, we um, we you know, we have a record. It's not just aspirational, but they can really measure results. Right now, now. The other thing I, that you mentioned, you mentioned the district and how the district had changed a little bit. Redistricting usually happens after a census. Is that when Yes, that's that, so, correct. So there will probably be some sort of redistricting depending there on the There will be, census. yeah. So it's all based because the census, you know, counts how many people, you know, we know that Westchester is probably going to see uh, a little bit of growth from the 2010 census. And then upstate in New York, they've lost population. So when they start with the reapportionment for New York State, it'll start out on Long Island and it moves farther north. And so uh, the district lines will all ultimately change a little and New York State will probably lose one, uh, if not two um, uh, represent representatives in, in Congress. Uh -huh. See that's because I and then we're we're getting ready to do this um infomercial on the census. So if you want to just speak to your constituents and constituents on how important filling out the census is. I would love to. It's you you know that is it is so important because the dollars that for every person that feels like they can't be bothered to send in the form or do the application the uh, census questionnaire online, which literally takes, I think I did mine in three minutes right. for my family. For every person that doesn't do that, that costs our communities 
$2,700 annually for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So $27,000 for a 10 year period, a family of four, that's over a hundred thousand dollars. So it is so incredibly important. And I, I've been trying to get that message out to my community, but I think even more importantly than just the district that I represent, I've noticed in Westchester communities that have a higher portion of people of color, for whatever reason, um, people have in, you know, in previous census, uh, the estimate is that there's been a, a low turnout of those censuses getting turned in, which means it costs the cities that, that people of color live in real dollars. And, and yeah, I, I, would, I think I would... it just hasn't been, you know, the dots haven't been connected for, no. for people to understand that there is a consequence that is a, a, a financial consequence to their communities that could help education and schools and you know job creation and and you know really offset property taxes and that this can be a real game changer. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Mount Vernon and I think Lorraine is in now. Are you there, Lorraine? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Oh my God! <laughs> Hi, people. Yes, yes. And Lorraine, and Lorraine, is in, Lorraine, <laughs> Lorraine is so in good Yonkers. to see you. Yeah, Lorraine is in Yonkers and Mount Vernon in Yonkers. Yeah. Right now, are the two lowest turnout in turning in the census right now, yeah. and both communities are um, considerably undercounted. Like right. just for instance, in the 1960 census or something like that, Mount Vernon had 70,000 people. In 2010, it had 68,000 people. And I think it's closer to 100. Yes, you know what I mean? so, so, so. absolutely. Yeah. And Yonkers has been trying to get over that 200,000 person point. Was yeah. it 100? Two hundred thousand. Yeah, um, um, and and Yonk, ten years ago, I was working for the city of Yonkers, and I was put in charge of the census along with Lee M. Elman from planning and development. We fell short. Mm. We did one hundred and eighty-eight thousand plus, but we fell short of the two hundred thousand mark. And now the May mayor's panel has put me on on the mayor's census count committee. And I, I had a discussion with um, Melissa Goldberg, who's in charge uh, for the mayor's office. And, and, and what she told me was, because we were discussing, you know, reaching out to the immigrant population. And what she said to me, which really took me by surprise, was the fact that she said, Lorraine, the problem we're having is the African-American community. We're having a big problem with the African immunity community, you know, taking the census. I, I, I was surprised. And I know, I know your district is a, a diverse district. <clears throat> that that that, that um, there is a, a lot of people of color, um, and there's some undeserved, under, underserved areas in there as well. Right. So, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think about thirty percent of the district are people of color, and and certainly, you know, living in the community that I I live in currently, I represent. Mimaranek, which has um, a high population of, of immigrants to the community. Um, and the, the, the good thing um, from the job that I've been doing in Westchester County, uh, you know, I'm very familiar with the issues related to Peekskill and Yonkers and Mount Vernon. So then when we're talking about Spring Valley in Rockland County, I think the, the again the situation is very relatable to the the situations yes. that I've seen in our major cities in Westchester. So, you know, already knowing going into it that um, you know again this goes to the disparity, the growing wealth inequity, the growing difficulty in in having a level playing field for education because it's based upon a property tax yeah. formula. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and that we're not getting the federal dollars. And when I found out, you know, the federal budget for education for the entire country is only $64 billion. It sounds like a big number, but when you think about it in terms of the, the budget for Westchester County is $1.2 billion. And mm -hmm. when you think of this a huge country that that education budget has to serve, it really shows that our federal government is sending a very strong message. It doesn't believe in our education system for everyone. It doesn't believe in that fairness. And mm -hmm. it doesn't believe that 
anything other than the wealth of the property owners in those communities should be paying for the majority of our, our funding for our education system, which is, it's completely words to what we need to stand for as a country to be competitive in a 21st century and to, to be a, a country where we really do ascribe to the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we're a land of opportunity. Because right now, the way that the government pays for things, we're not a land of opportunity. So let me ask you a couple, um, if elected, what committee would you like to chair? I mean, I understand that you don't, I don't think freshmen get to pick no. their committees, <laughs> but what committee would you like to chair? So, um, you know, I, I always like to equate it to the work that I'm doing now in Westchester County, because I sit on seven committees but I chair mm -hmm. one. I, right now I'm chairing the committee for um, economic development planning and energy. And as I had <clears throat> stated earlier, you know, I came into office with wanting my legacy to be the environment and having a, already built a pretty good resume for, for initiatives that I have you know, led on the local level, both for my community of uh, where I live and also for Westchester County as a whole. Um, on the environmental uh, level. And I see climate change, you know, before the pandemic, I really believed that climate change was the key to, um, to everything, to changing this world, and that we needed to take this on. And it had to be more than just voting for a Green New Deal, which I believe a Green New Deal is great, but we had to do more. And it really, my feeling was that climate change could also be, um, an opportunity as job creation, you know, working uh, to create really good paying jobs. And just as a, for instance, I met recently with NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Research and Development uh, um, Agency. And I was meeting with them to learn more about the wind farms off of Long Island and New Jersey for New York State, where we're gonna get a lot of power the starting salary for like entry level starting salary for the, the wind farm is a hundred thousand dollars. I mean, these that's, are re that's really entry level. Entry that's level. Entry. Yes. Wow. Great paying jobs. And they're going to be, um, the expectation is that over uh, the next 10 years, that's going to create 10,000 jobs. That's huge. So really good paying jobs. Now, if we rolled this out, if we looked at this regionally, both for the Hudson Valley, for New York State, and then lastly for the country, you know, this is how we rebuild the middle class. So, mm -hmm. so to your question about the committee, yeah, I would love to chair the Environment Committee, but frankly, with all the work that needs to get done in this country, I, I'm I'm looking forward to participating in decisions pertaining to uh, to energy. I'm looking forward to you know. Uh, of getting involved in committees pertaining to um, budget and appropriations would be kind of nice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure. I think infrastructure, if we, if we did this right with, um, you know, tackling climate change and really looking at it as almost like a WPA, um, you know, from the depression, like a work program that we could push out and help educate our youth and help give them a basis for good paying jobs. This is how we get somewhere in this country, rebuilding the middle class, which is what we need to do. And also helping, look, not everybody is the type of um, person that would benefit from going to college, but they should be able to get job training, to get a job that they can sustain a good living. And right. what we have seen in this country is that the 60% of jobs created since 1990 have been low paying service jobs where you can't sustain yourself, much less a family on those I'm jobs. I'm, I'm glad you said that because the president touts how many jobs he created. And, um, <laughs> if, if, no, and, and, and he has created jobs, but uh, so, he got people from being underemployed to, to un, you know, for unemployed to underemployed. Like, you know what yes. I mean? Like you can't live. I lived in Atlanta for 10 years. And one of the things that the two biggest, um, two of the biggest employers were Walmart and um, 
and McDonald's. Um, I, I mean, it was others, Home Depot, yeah. others, but of, of those, sixty percent of the people who work there. Sixty percent of the people who work there. Okay, Lou is trying to call me. Um, <laughs> shout out to Lou. Uh, and, um, sixty percent of the people that work, um, for, for those two companies have some sort of um, um, food stamps subsidy. Or, or subsidy yep. because right. they can't, because they don't make enough. And I'm talking about managers. Yeah. Like there's managers that were on food stamps, like, you know, right. at, at, the, at these jobs. And so, so that really doesn't serve you well. I mean, you have a job and you have to do your 40 plus hours in overtime and you still don't make enough no. to, um, you don't make enough but to, yeah. Yeah, I, and your point is so well taken because the two biggest employers in this country now, Walmart still and Amazon, you know, okay, and, yes. and, and, and so here's where it's really become like corporate welfare, because we are then, so, you know, we're supporting those corporations, they're not paying us back in corporate taxes, you know, Amazon doesn't pay their taxes and Walmart underpays. So we're not getting our fair share. We end up having to, then their employees aren't getting their fair share. You know, they're working for the, for the good of that company and to build that wealth. They don't have a stake in that. Then, and then we, as the government, you know, we end up subsidizing what actually should be part of the cost of doing business for corporations like Walmart and Amazon. And it, it's, it's, again, this is where the system has been rigged for so long. I mean, it's been at least 40 years where over a, a series of administrations, we just haven't fought for the middle class. And we've seen more people fall out of the middle class and become working poor, right. which is... You know, and again, my grandfather um, didn't go to college. My grandfather worked as a builder. My great grandfather was a milk milkman, a delivery milkman for Borden's. And um, you know, I read he, that. He, I read that. Yes. I read that. I read that too. <laughs> yeah, and you know, he had a pension. When wait, wait, he, and he drove, and he drove a horse drawn. Well, that yes. was in the winter. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So in nineteen, that picture was taken from nineteen twenty-seven. Because okay. he, it was a snowstorm and they still had horse and sled that he right. could deliver to White Plains and, and Scarsdale, which was part of his route. But when he retired in like 1958 or something, he retired with a pension. He had, you know, that job gave him security. He had a, a house in White Plains where he raised his four daughters. When my grandmother ended up going to nursing school and became a nurse, they were able to achieve the American dream. We have let people down because they can't achieve that dream anymore. They right. are working like, like dogs, two and three jobs just to put food on the table. And, and no job least, security. No job security, no right. pension. And, um, and now what we're seeing and COVID has just put a magnifying glass over the big problem in our society. No money for that emergency when they can't go to work mm -hmm. and the people that have had to stay home have been from communities uh, overwhelmingly you know the people that have stayed home that have are not getting paid during this time so many people uh people of color that have been affected by this and mm -hmm. and you know this is the crime of this of of where our our uh country has gone as far as taking care of its people absolutely absolutely like my um real quick so my my grandfather worked for General Motors for 35 years, and he got my dad the job, and he worked for General Motors for 35 years. You know, pensions and the whole nine. You know, a lot of people my age and below. Like one of the worst things that happened to Westchester was General Motors closing because it's yes. not only the employees there, but all the people around it that depended on, That's you know, right. the, the depended on, you know, part, they made money from from it being there. So right. it, it it hurt and and. And that was, um, Damon is, is, is fond of saying that um, in, the, in the black community, I know it's for, for certain, um, that was the middle class, the two middle, if you didn't have a, a college degree, it was General Motors and Westchester, the, the, the corrections. Yep. And, um, and the post you know, office, and the post office. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. um, so, so, and now it's just like when, when General Motors left, that was like, there is, it's almost no middle class now. It's just like the really right. rich and the real. It's like the rich and the poor. Like there's no right. middle, you know. So I'm yeah, probably, yeah. 
I'm probably jumping ahead to a question you're going to ask me, which, you know, I'm just going to refer to NAFTA because in 1992, when the North American uh, Free Trade Agreement was being debated in Congress, I thought I, I could see the writing on the wall. We were going to lose good jobs in this country, good paying jobs. They were going to go overseas where people, we were not going to have the same uh, work laws that we have to protect our people. And, and you know, Nita Lowy, as much as I love and admire her, you know, she, she supported NAFTA. I think that both parties were at, at fault with that. You know, that there was- Good for you for um, saying that. Good for you for saying yeah. that. Good for you. So, I mean, I, I have felt for a long time that it has been over many, many different administrations, 40 years of people just not standing up for those of us that recognize that, you know, this country was based on being better than oligarchies and countries in other places of the world where you have this very wealthy, you know, 1%, 0.1% of wealth, um, you know, concentrated and then a growing poor class, which is what we've just been seeing for, for decades. Um, two things, yeah, his, history shows that we left, in, we, we, we had a revolution, we started the country because of this, to get away from yeah. that, that whole thing. And that's what we're getting back to. Um, you mentioned Mia Lowy. Um, a uh, couple of quick shout outs. Uh, Yonkers, Councilwoman Tasha Diaz, Paul Anthony Cuesta, uh, Charles Stern from Red Blue Talk, Jeffrey Myers, uh, Meyer, um, Ken Bright, Tony Book, uh, Avalaz, I, I don't know if I pronounced it right. I apologize if I mispronounce it. Uh, Luis Cherico and Greenberg, Tasha Diaz said hello to all of us. Um, hey, Tasha. Hey. Paul, Paul Anthony Cuesta. Paul Anthony yeah. Cuesta. Miss Catherine, Miss Catherine, I don't know if you know him, but he's a good person to know. I know him. I've him. known him a long time. I've known him since Very he was a Republican. With the environment. Yeah. <laughs> so Charles Stern, the Charles Stern, who yeah. has a red blue talk. Yeah. He, he said, finally, someone acknowledged that Mia Lowy was no help. Um, well, she wasn't perfect. She didn't say that. She, she was didn't not say perfect. That. No, no, that's yeah. what Charles. She that's did what not Charles, say that. That's what Charles said. She did um, not say that. Um, I have a couple thank of you, questions. Thank okay. you, Lauren. Okay, let me let me let me finish with let me, let me ask her the Neil Lowy question though. Um, sure. Okay. So so so, um, I read that she's somewhat of a mentor to you. Mm -hmm. Um, um, what um, and she's very popular. So yeah. what? What do you say to her supporters? Why they should vote for you? And, um, you know, what, what y'all have in common? And then what things do you bring that you would bring to that seat that maybe is not there now? Right. So uh, I think what Nita Lowy has done for our region has been tremendous. I mean, first of all, she is considered one of the most powerful people in Congress and holds the purse strings. So just for two points of interest, because of the COVID crisis, we are receiving um, the first bit of money that she directed towards our nonprofits in the region, um, mostly our nonprofits and our local governments, was uh, about um, $6 million. But more recently, just in the last couple of days, came the bigger, much, much bigger um, uh, package that she's sending to local communities, which is going to be, I, I, I forget the exact number, but I know it's in the, you know, eight, eight or nine um, figures, you know, it's, it's up there, which is gonna be a huge help. I know that for Westchester County, we're looking at that money. Um, it can only be uh, utilized in relation to the money that we've been spending. And we've had tremendous, you know, uh, you know our, our expenses, for the COVID crisis have been astronomical. So it's it's going to like our Beeline bus service, which we've had we've kept running for folks um, mm -hmm. to help you know get them to work. But we've we've had people riding for free because we didn't want there was no way to collect the money without it putting our drivers um, you know in danger. So we've we had right. to you know change a whole bunch of things. I just use that as a for instance. But people should support me, uh, and and because. I am a fighter like Nita Lowy. I think Nita Lowy has been a great fighter for this area. Uh, she helped get us our, our new bridge, which I think is great. 
but it's been left with a hole in the middle. And so there's still work to be done, which is, I think, a, uh, you know, light rail, would, which would connect Rockland County to the rest of the district so that they could get into um, Manhattan easier. I mean, for Rockland County, they are really off to the side there and they really need transportation. So I see that as being a major um, area that I can continue doing the great work that Nita Lowy has done. And, and again, she has served her constituents, um, many of her constituents very well. Where we differ is probably in, in uh, again, how I was raised. I was raised by a single mother and, you know, who was a school teacher and a grandmother who was a nurse. And so I think just because of my background and what I was raised, how I was raised, um, I, I ended up having the uh, benefit of seeing people who were, you know, living in a wealthy community. I, you know, we went to Fox Lane, uh, was our middle school and high school. And yet we were lived in sort of the poorer part of the district. And uh, I was actually in the minority of the immediate community where I lived. And, and I think that was good. You know, it, it gave me, I think, a, um, uh, a real, um, you know, front row seat into what a lot of other families were experiencing. And I think that that is something that I will bring as a, as a Congresswoman. I take, I take that with me to Congress. And I think that, as I mentioned earlier, I, I feel we have a lot of work to do to, to bring things back towards where we were before things started under Ronald Reagan. I mean, we've gone so far to the right. We're not, we have no fear. You know, when I talk about the need for Medicare for all and people say, oh, that's a socialist thing, it, which is ridiculous. We have a long way to go in this country before we're talking about socialism. We're talking about a, a public health plan that will serve this country and people of this country, just like social security. And yes, it has the word social in it, but it is part of the social safety net. It doesn't change the fact that this is still a capitalist country and we still believe in opportunity and we still believe in American innovation and competition. But we do need to take care of people. And that is what I am going to bring to this. I have one more question before there um, was a follow up question and Lorraine goes. Um, you mentioned NAFTA and you mentioned, you know, not being in favor of it. Are you in favor of what's taken the new one that is taking its place, the new thing that they're trying to put? Well, uh, no, I didn't think it went far enough. I was a little surprised, and I, I when I met with some of my friends in labor, you know, the AFL CIO ended up supporting it. I I said to them, I don't understand why it it to my uh, reasoning, it didn't um, go far enough to really help bring those jobs back to the United States. Um, I think we need to look at our um, industry and, and how we, as a country, uh, look, we're in a situation right now where we have no PPE for this COVID crisis because it's all manufactured in China. And when the federal government was given an opportunity to work with a manufacturer in this country, they turned a blind eye. That should have yeah. never happened. Yeah. And so I think there are more opportunities than that. And when we talk about, again, I'm going to keep talking about climate change because it's just, you know, it's another area where we as Americans can really take that as a, an industry where we can work and manufacture here in this country and, and actually have that as something that could be exported to other, other parts of the world and bring it to other countries that are, that um, are less, you know, have, have less than us, but we can be leaders in this. Lorraine, go ahead. All right, okay, I got a couple of questions. Okay. They're all related to COVID. All right, good. Uh, number one, what do you think of mailing voting as opposed to going to the polls? Number two is, um, what is your opinion about the reopening of New York State? And is there anything that Governor Cuomo did that you would have done differently? Okay, so let's start with mail-in voting. I'm thrilled that we're doing mail-in absentee ballots. Frankly, um, this has been something that even before COVID, I was very much in support. In California, 
Uh, and I, the reason why I, I know a lot about this particular issue is uh, a couple of years ago, our county wanted to purchase uh, new voting machines that were, it was a pretty expensive um, bond act that we were being asked to look into. And so I was doing some research and I found out a comparable county in California, Costa County, they have the majority of their votes are cast by mail-in ballot. And it's much cheaper and, you know, voter fraud, which is where you all uh, usually hear the argument against, there are ways that you can have the envelope that the person signs on the back of the envelope, you send it in, you can match it to the signature in the book. Yeah, it is, oh, yeah, it yeah. is absolutely, uh, you know, you can still prevent voter fraud. So I think it's wonderful that we have it. And I'm hoping that though we have absentee ballot, um, voting happening widespread in New York State, everybody's gonna get an application. And please, I'm asking everybody who's watching, to send that application in to get your absentee ballot to vote by mail. Um, I'm hoping that this will show the, the New York State Board of Elections that this is really where we need to be putting our efforts into getting people to participate in government and to vote. Uh, so that's first. Your second question was to, um, uh, can you repeat the second part of that, Lorraine? Uh, uh, what is your opinion on the way the governor is structuring the reopening of New York State, and if there is anything you would have done differently. Right, so um, I think the governor has been a tremendous leader for, uh, New, you know, for not just New York, actually, I have friends and relatives yeah. in other parts of the country who say to me, you are so lucky that you have a real leader uh -huh. in, in uh, for, for New York. We're very jealous, you know, of, uh, of your governor. And I think that Governor Cuomo has done a, a tremendous job. And one of the, the, the things that, there were several things, I mean, I don't wanna take up a whole lot of time on this interview talking about it, but I think he's been very smart in recognizing that New York state is a big state with diverse areas. So the metropolitan area, and I'll include Westchester and Rockland in that area with Long Island and the city and, you know, we, we are very different than upstate New York. So kind of coming up with the parameters for opening up and recognizing that upstate where they didn't have the same degree of COVID that we had downstate, that they're ahead of us and let them open first. But I think he, he showed true leadership by um, taking every precaution in the early part of this to make sure that if God forbid, this thing was as rampant as it seemed and that hospitalizations were gonna be jumping through the roof, that we, we were gonna be ready with a faci facilities for people to go to. Go th to. So I, I think he has done a great job. Um, anything that I would do differently than what the gover governor has done? Um, it's a great question. Do you uh, think he failed the nursing homes? Oh, the nursing home situation. Yeah. You know, I think we are going to have to have a deeper dive after this is over to really understand um, where the decision was made. I'm not sure. How, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree you know, with you. Uh, you know, hindsight's always 2020. Uh, but I, I would like to, to hear more about that because obviously it's very troubling knowing that um, the most vulnerable population, you know, our elderly and those in nursing homes uh, were, were at a, you know, real disadvantage by having people that were healing from COVID to be Back uh, in, put yeah. in the nursing homes. Yeah. I, I, I would want to know more about that. So, Fair, so enough. Now, Fair enough. Now, Thank you. Now I want to do more of a lightning round. I want to get more questions in, but we don't have a whole lot of time. Okay. Um, now, now, um, I seen all the Democrats. They, um, you know, they had their their presidential candidates that they that they they preferred, and now they're all saying, you know, Biden because he looks like the nominee now. Um, your preferred candidate was Elizabeth Warren, I believe, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So, so, um, and and I know you said if when you'll support the, the Democratic nominee. Um, yeah. What 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 say Biden is the nominee? What um, what things that attracted you to 
to Elizabeth Warren, would you like to stick over Biden in the first place? Would you like to see Biden take on if? Wow, where do I begin? <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a loaded question here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, uh, I believe that um, Joe Biden will be head and shoulders over what we currently have. So at the end of the day, yes, let's all <laughs> cast our vote for Joe Biden and this will be a huge improvement. Now, what, what do I think would be my ultimate, like, you know, I, I don't know that he's gonna take the platform of Elizabeth Warren um, in his first term. Um, you know, I was a supporter of Medicare for all. I don't think Joe Biden has said that, you know, I think he sees a public option. I mean, the ACA has been successful on some level, but, but if coronavirus has done one thing, I think it's shown us how vulnerable people are who even had insurance, um, but it's been connected to their job or their spouse's job or that, you know, one thing we haven't heard about yet with this virus, but it's to come, mark my words on this one, the number of people that will have to declare bankruptcy, because even with insurance, they, the hospitalization and, and going through everything for COVID, they still are going to be on the hook for some bills, and they are not going to be able to pay for that. And I think it's going to be a huge, huge number. So Medicare for all, I would be thrilled if uh, if a President Biden would decide that COVID has proven that this country needs to be a bit bolder than what he was proposing uh, earlier. And I would love to see that happen. Now, now um, we talked about, um, while you were talking about the mail-in ballot um, situation, um, a couple of viewers had concerns about that, and people have had concerns since they've heard about it. The biggest one is that's going to lead to fraud. You're going to have deaf, dead people voting. Um, what stops somebody if there if there are polls open? What stops somebody from doing a mail in and then going to the poll too? Like, there's a lot of concerns right now. I don't know if those concerns are being addressed. I I do believe while we're in this need to stay home and social distance, maybe having the polls open might not be the, the big, the best option, but you know, sometimes when we make these moves like, like the criminal justice reforms, there's some stuff that they, which needed to be done, but it was, I think, rushed. And now we're seeing that, you know, some things needed to be changed. What things um, do you think um, could, could improve that? Because, you know, it's a right. very important election. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, you're, our, the viewer who sent that question in, it's a, it's a very, very important question. Um, and, you know, you want to have faith in the election process. But I, I will say two things that I hope give the viewer um, a little bit of uh, comfort that they don't need to worry. One, what may be different this year as opposed to other years is that we're not going to have the results on election night because we are still going to be going through and receiving the absentee ballots. Go and that's okay. I think that that's all right. If that's what we, the price we have to pay for double checking um, a ebook voter registration sign-in versus a paper mail-in ballot to make sure that whichever one arrived first, that only one of those two things is counted. Um, I think that that's going to be critical to the success of this. And I think that that can be done. Uh, we've been doing that, by the way, for a number of years. Uh, you know, people before this election um, have, you know, asked for an absentee ballot and voted absentee because they had plans. Plans change, they end up in town, they forget that they've you know, already sent it in and they go, they vote in person and their absentee ballot arrives, but they, they are crossed, it's cross-referenced and they, uh, the, the, the state BOE, the county BOE, they, they can see if somebody's already voted and they don't, they don't count that second vote. So um, I, I think that there is a way that, uh, and as far as dead people, 
Um, the Board of Elections has been doing a better job over the years. Now, I've been involved in running for elections since my, I ran in my first election in 2003. So I've been around for a while on this. And I've seen that over the last, at least the last decade uh, locally in, in, in Westchester, that I think our Board of Elections has done a pretty good job of um, making sure that we didn't have um, people that were deceased for like a, any length of time that they were still on the on the voter rolls. So I, 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 know, I think I know, that. I know in Mount Vernon, and hate to cut you off, I know in Mount Vernon, and I was involved in the Richard Thomas, the 2015 uh, Mayor Richard Thomas race, and uh, what that he won. And, uh, and um, there were, um, at that time, 20, in 2015, there were several people that were, were had not been purged from the uh, voter rolls. From, from, the, from the voter rolls, and we had situations like that where you know people were claiming fraud for this reason or that reason so i can understand why people would be concerned about that um, wait, wait, aj just to be clear mm -hmm. the voting polls are closed and it's only going to be the uh for well, the not, not, offici not officially yet no we don't no, know we haven't... don't know yeah we don't know if they're going to be open or not they they've made no decision to close them they're, they're offering everyone uh, a valid form yeah. and that should be mailed to every voter and then you have to fill it out and then, you know, get your absentee ballot and mail it in. So, um, um, <laughs> someone said the governor has failed Mount Vernon. I do agree. The governor, the state, the county, everybody's failed Mount Vernon. But that's another story. That's not your district. So I well, that's right. You know, Yonkers. actually, let's not forget Yonkers. They failed Yonkers too. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think it, you know, the frustration, and I, I hear you, there have been um, instances where I wish that we had had um, testing sites up in Yonkers and Mount Vernon earlier than what we ended up doing, but I think it was just, you Especially know. Especially since they're so densely populated, like there's, you know. You know, you know what's amazing? Yeah. So we got, we got this testing site at 10710. Mm -hmm. um, area in Yonkers, which is the most affected area in the county. It's right, it's literally right around the corner from my house. Mm -hmm. People have the opportunity to go get tested. I go by there every day. It's empty. What? Empty. Well, um, uh, what is so that? What do you, Lorraine, what do you, what, what do you chalk that up to? Why, why are people not going? I, I I think it's the same reason African Americans are not filling out the census. I don't think they're ed I, I, I don't want to say they're ed I think they're educated, but I don't think they're educated enough on the severity of it. I, 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 that's just my opinion. I, I, I think there should there needs to be more reaching out to certain folks. So can I just add one thing to that, AJ, mm -hmm. if I could? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been doing a little bit of, uh, of work on um, uh, learning more about racism and implicit bias. And, uh, and it's been a process for the last couple of years. And one of the things I've learned about is sort of the trauma related to racism and the, the cycle that racism begins, which is racism, poverty, uh, lack of opportunity, and then hopelessness. And when you've reached a point of hopelessness, when you feel that you know you you've been calling out for help and nobody answers, um, you know I I I, I feel for for our, the people that are at that point in the in the cycle, and and it's. You know, it's that's that's the hardest part when you feel like, well, no people, there are people here that care. I care, you know, and there are people that want to help. And when somebody, um, because of feeling like nothing matters, it's still going to be the same old, same old, and they, you know, choose not to vote or or you know, it's hard. I'm glad, you know, I'm glad you have that, a lot I'm of empathy. That, I'm glad that you said that. What the heck? Right. I'm, I'm I want to say something nice. Okay. Yes, I want to yes. say to her, she has a lot of empathy, and it's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Lorraine. I'm, I'm glad that you said that because um, a lot of people don't realize that, and a lot not um, a lot of people that are not people of color do not realize that they don't. You know, 
um, that classism is just as strong right now, um, how this affects the low income areas, um, yeah. you know, how, how systematic racism has played a role. Oh and gosh, yes. Continues to play a role. And I don't hear enough yeah. candidates speak on that, Yeah. Um, period. Um, well, I can tell you when I first became an elected official in 2008, I did not know the word redlining. I did okay. not know about how people of color had their properties devalued and taken away to for quote unquote public works, creating roads, highways, whatever. Gentrification right here in the waterfront. Absolutely. And it's, you know, to see the basis of that, you know, um, in this county and mm. in this area and you think, oh, but it's New York, New York, we're not like that. And to know that, yep, well, it was right, it was right here. And uh, we see the effects of that today. In 2014, 2015, um, I was part of or um, uh, several police community relation forums, Yonkers, Peekskill, New Rochelle, Mount Vernon, um, White Plains, Greenberg, a few other places. And one thing every police chief told me, and so either told me in an interview or said at those forums, is there is no racism in their police department. That, that you know, so like no Westchester County police chief has admitted that there is racism in their police department, including Gardner, because Gardner said it too. Um, the he was commissioner in Yonkers. Um so most 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 don't see God, that. Gardner was a good guy. Which no, is I'm why no, we... but I mean he also said though yeah. there was no racism. He, 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 I quoted him a few times. He actually said that. So, Which is, so yeah, it's it's why we need to be talking about implicit bias more because I think for some people it's hard to acknowledge and see that you know humans, every every one of us. You know, we, we have all sorts of implicit biases that are unconscious. And so I understand people wanting to think that there is not as much racism in our communities as there is. But if we talk about it in a term that is, um, that talks about it as part of the human condition that we can, we can change implicit bias, but we have to acknowledge it first and like discovering that. I think that's a, you know, how you, you can, start having those conversations and getting getting somewhere. The other thing that um, several elected officials I've talked to around the county, uh, uh, people um, outside the more the traditional urban areas that act like homelessness is not a problem in Westchester County. Um, it is. When places like Mount Vernon and, Nourish, and, and Yonkers specifically have been dumping grounds for these other communities um, you know, they, 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 they get rid of, they, 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 they dump it. So, dumps, they, dumps them they, over here. Yeah. 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 So they don't, so they, they, so maybe now there is no homelessness in your community because you've dumped them, but it's still <laughs> in, and in one of the wealthiest counties, we have such a, a, a wealth disparity, a wealth we do. inequality. Um, we absolutely do. I, I, I agree with you completely. The, the problem is still here. Um, we, and, and, you know, I think I've learned that um, I, I credit the Westchester Women's Agenda and the Westchester County, um, the, the Westchester Child Care Council with uh, doing a pretty good job of educating elected officials that we have a lot of students that are living in poverty and um, that are homeless, homeless students, college age students that are really on the verge. And, kids coming out of the foster care system and I one of my friends from high school um, you know she has an organization that works with foster care kids because she herself was a foster care kid and as soon as she turned 18 she was basically couch surfing and that's what we have in Westchester County here. Now I want to oh, I, I got a question. So, oh, well let me get this in because it's we're coming to close um, I see that you're an environmental advocate Mm -hmm. um, or at least that's been as termed. Um, you've been called that. Yep. Um, um, I wanted to give you a chance to speak about any environmental initiatives, um, which are a focus of your campaign. I know, and, so, and I don't think we spoke a lot about that. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to at least speak on that. Sure. So aside from the the big uh, planetary issue of climate change and the climate crisis, uh, one of the ways that I would like to see the federal government step up is uh, we have to have a plan to 
uh, say no to all forms of fossil fuel and really start seriously looking at renewable energy. And um, that means stopping, stopping the subsidies that we have for coal and gas and, and oil. And um, it means uh, no more infrastructure for, uh, for gas in this country and no more fracking. And I think that this is really something that we have to be talking about because in truth, it's, it ends up being, and you know, here's where it intersects with like the social justice issue. You know, we see it in, and one of the things that I came into office as a county legislator uh, looking at was the particulate matter of um, dirty residual um, oil that was being burned in our major cities in Westchester. I had a list of 500 buildings. Most of them were in Yonkers and Mount Vernon and White Plains and, and you know, very few in my, my district, but I saw it around the county and I talked to doctors from Mount Sinai uh, Hospital from the part that helps with children and the number of hospitalizations in areas and communities that have this particulate matter, um, hospitalizations for kids with asthma and breathing dis dis you know, difficulty was really um, astronomical. And so it becomes a social justice issue as well. So it's, it's certainly part of what I wanna work on across the country for environmental policy. I think that uh, we're seeing one of the benefits of COVID is that we have cleaner air right now, which yes. for Westchester is kind of amazing because we live in a non-attainment zone for clean air. Um, so, so this is something that I, I think it's all right. I look at communities and Mount Vernon in particular, um, this is something that I have been talking with my friends that Save the Sound, um, you know, the infrastructure for uh, the sanitary sewer system and the old pipes that we have uh, for some of our communities where these are multi-million dollar projects to fix those broken pipes, to clean our waters. And the communities, I know Mount Vernon would love to be, uh, you know, a I would love that clean water. I know Mount Vernon would love to have that for its community. It just doesn't have the money. And at this point, you know, I think we need to figure out a way for the federal government to help. And I would give help to Elliot Engel to make that happen. And I think Elliot and I could work together to do some, some great things for, for our, uh, your communities as well. But, but this is part of what I want to take with me. My, my understanding of, of, uh, you know, sort of some of the bigger environmental issues facing uh, a lot of areas around this country. And, and being able to talk to farmers out West about food insecurity and the, 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 the food chain and how the system works and how we can help, uh, help those communities if we all just, if we all work together on some of these environmental initiatives, I think that's mm -hmm. how, how I would see getting, um, getting some colleagues, maybe from across the aisle or, or more conservative Democrats to come on board and say, okay, I'll work with you on uh, some of the, this environmental policy. Um, Lorraine, last question. Okay, this is an important question. If you're gonna be a Congresswoman, I need to know, it, it's, I, I'm sure you've seen the videos of the way some folks treat African Americans as opposed to Caucasians regarding social distancing. Yes, I have seen, seen those videos. You've seen that some people got masks and some people got beat to a pulp. Yep. Tell me, I sure have. what do you feel about that? I feel many things, including anger, that that is the reality that, as I've seen it with those videos, I feel. Uh, you know, um, sadness that in 2020, that, uh, and again, speaking about implicit bias, if that isn't a case for implicit bias coming out and creating a different, a different outcome for a situation that happens in, you know, whether a white community or a community of color, 
that that's an example of where implicit bias creates the situation where you have people getting treated differently with with the same exact uh, scenario yeah. yeah so i'm going to keep talking about it actually whether i get into congress or not i feel that this is something that i can help amplify as an elected official that we need to be addressing and talking about this is real there is a difference you can see it and we have to we have to take that on so um i'm gonna um, give you a, a chance last question anything i didn't ask you so to sum it up for the people so you support the green new deal health care reform um definitely an advocate of the environment um, I think those are all good things to know. Is there anything I didn't ask you? Oh, first off, um, for anybody hearing, hearing, seeing you for the first time, um, hearing you for the first time, um, how do they get in touch with you? Social media, websites? Sure. They want to know more about you, donate, yeah. volunteer, or whatever? Yeah, so my website is katherineforcongress.com. My Facebook page is Catherine for Congress. Uh, I'm on Twitter. It's... Uh, Catherine NY17. And uh, I have an Instagram too, which um, out of all the social media, that one is I'm less uh, comfortable with, but but shoot me a, a, a message or um, you can you reach me in any one of those those venues, check out my website and um, I'd love to have you as, as part of uh, Team Parker. And um, anything I didn't ask you, and again is, a heated race, eight candidates. Um, why should the people in that district cast their vote for you? Sure. Well, one thing we didn't talk about, I mean, you know, we could do the lightning round of thumbs up, thumbs down for some areas. You know, I'm, I'm pro-choice. I uh, feel very strongly that we need to codify, codify Roe v. Wade. And I'm actually also very interested in, um, there's a big discrepancy in medical research for women on major, like very common ailments, you know, whether it's heart disease or cancer or what have you, mm -hmm. women have not, have been uh, overlooked in, in many ways. And we need to fund, I think, additional studies. And I, I uh, feel that that's very important. I want to help women uh, who are you know, working while pregnant and, you know, if they have a service job where they're cashier and they are not allowed water breaks, and believe me, this is still going on all over yeah. this country. Mm -hmm. So I wanna help the working woman who's really just trying to help put food on her table. And in Westchester, I was very proud when I was majority leader, we passed a slew of progressive legislation that I know I wanna see across this country, like paid sick leave. Paid sick leave was something we did in 2018, before, may I add, before New York State did it. And Westchester, one of the things I'm proud of is that I helped to make Westchester a leader for the state, and I want to continue to do that. So, um, you know, that's that's a little bit of a quick lightning round of who I am as an elected official. If you want to learn more, uh, reach out, you know, check out my website. And, um, and I want to thank Black Westchester for... For having having me, thank you, AJ. Thank you for for Lorraine for such um, great questions, and um, and also to people that have been watching. I want to just say uh, one word. I really hope that all of you who are watching who are affected by COVID are managing. Um, my office has been doing. We've been doing uh, constituent services seven days a week, 24 seven, basically helping people. And if there's something out there that you feel that you need help with and you want you to take a look at, reach out to my office too. I, I'd be happy to do that. I, I do have two questions, but because of time, I want to give you, they have to be brief. The answers have to be brief. Okay. <laughs> um, income equality. You was talking about women's rights. Income yeah. equality. Speak on that briefly. Sure. Thoughts. Well, I mean, we have so much to do with it. You know, income equality. Why is it that people who are making money while sleeping because of their investments and you know that sort of unearned wealth, why is that not getting taxed at the same rate that people who are working three jobs to put food on the table are getting taxed? We have a real problem. We need to look at tax regulations. Uh, I do support uh, a, you know, Elizabeth Warren talked about a uh, two cent tax on the ultra rich, you know, those who had wealth of 
50 million or more. And I, I think that's a good first, first step because I do think that um, 50, to, to have achieved 50 million, you're talking about 0.01% of this country. And um, I think it's, you know, even the millionaires can, can feel like they've been gypped out from what the, um, the ultra millionaires have been able to, to how they've been able to grow their wealth. And corporations, we touched on this earlier, we really need to, um, you know, take a look at the, oh, hey, I see Damon there. So, 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 look at, at, um, you know, the, uh, the corporate tax loopholes have got to be closed because Amazon should not have one more year where they're not paying their fair share, nor should Walmart. We have a lot of catching up to do. Campaign reform. Yes. Uh, in fact, campaign reform, I have um, reached out to uh, Congresswoman Katie Porter from California and Congressman Max Rose from Staten Island. They are part of the campaign reform caucus. And I said, hey, I want to join your caucus when I get to Washington. We need campaign reform. I mean, Citizens United has got to be overturned. This country, had th this is how Congress is bought and paid for by lobbyists representing the largest corporations in this country. And while you and I don't have a say in very much of this government. And so we need campaign finance reform badly. We've got to level the playing field. Um, you know, I see it in my own race. Uh, and uh, so we, we need to do what we can to, uh, to, to make that fairer for, for people. You know, I, I, even in other races, I can say that, um, it's sad when the first thing that somebody says to you is if you don't have money to, to, to run in this race, you're not going to get anywhere. And that disincentivizes that, and that's a the lot. reality. And that really is the reality of it, too. Yeah, yeah. Which leads to not always the best candidates. Um, if you have a few minutes, though, since Damon just tuned in, if Damon, you got any questions? Hey, Damon. Uh, hey, how you doing? No, good to um, see you. Yeah, good to see you, too. I'm um, sorry I'm late tuning in, but you right. see how happy we all are to see yeah. you, David? Everybody was like, hey, David. The, the, no, the, viewers, was, the viewers just went up too. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I, have, I, have, I have no question. I just wish you luck. And, oh, uh, thank you, Damon. Um, yeah. I appreciate that very much. And again, uh, we had a good talk. I, I did miss you in the conversation. I, would have, I think you would have enjoyed it. We had a lot of back and forth and... Um, you know, one thing I, I think we could probably all agree, it was a conversation, which probably for people watching at home, as opposed to just an, a, a question than an answer, it was a good conversation. I, I learned a lot from you guys too. So I thank you for that. That's one of the things, you know, I've been writing professionally since 93. Um, that's one of the things that I've always done um, as opposed to the traditional questions is make it a conversation. I probably talk as much as the person I'm interviewing. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a, a viewer, Eddie Johnson said hello to everyone. And he said, great information. Um, oh, again, is there <laughs> anything I didn't ask you that you want people to know? I wanna make sure you had the opportunity to address everything you wanted to address, whether it's you know, COVID, whatever. whatever. Yeah, no, I, I honestly, I think we've, we've covered it, but um, uh, Lorraine, anything? What do you think we left out? Honey, I think I asked you all the tough questions and you were a champ. You were a champ. You, you answered them perfectly. Oh my God, I love you. Oh, I love you back. Well, well Alex, Alex Harrison, who's the one that gave me the question about the mail fraud, I mean, the, yeah. the, the voter fraud, uh, he actually said good luck with your campaign. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, so um, with that, um, we're coming to the close of the show. Um, I definitely one more time website. Uh, Catherine for Congress, media. Catherine for, for Congress .com and uh, and Facebook same Catherine for Congress, and uh, and again thank you everybody for tuning in and and paying attention to this race because frankly I know that a lot of people are just in survival mode and it's very yeah. hard when you're thinking about just keeping your family safe or putting food on your table to have to then you know, think about an election that's more than a, a month away. But I appreciate all of you who tuned in. And again, I, um, I wish everybody well. I hope everybody stays healthy. And, um, and, and thanks for the great chat. It was fun. And, and lastly, if um, I get the other candidates to agree, I'd like to see if I can get 
as many of y'all together, you know, just to have a conversation. It doesn't have to be a debate, I love it. A, a, a forum. A yeah, let's forum do it. Yeah, that would so, be great. So, so um, that's that's it for us. We want to thank great. you for taking the time. It was nice time. meeting you. Yeah, well, oh, I think we met. Pleasure. You're such, oh my God, what a breath of fresh air. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Lorraine. I really enjoyed this. This was great. But, and I want to thank you for taking the time um, um, to, 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 to talk to us and, and, and our audience and um, wish you the best in your campaign. And um, um, if you win, um, we hope that you will um, come back in your new position. I'd be happy um, to. And, 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 and continue to engage with our, with our, with our audience. Absolutely. You got it. In fact, I will even promise you that if I win, you will be the first Sunday interview that I do after the primary. I will, oh, there I will, you go. Wait, 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 one more thing. thing. Can you also promise that you will advertise with, with Black Witch as a magazine? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. You can do that All right. Very thank, good. thank you, Lorraine. <laughs> that was a good, that was a good, you, you're a good businesswoman, Lorraine. That was very <laughs> important. Yes. I'm glad you got that in. I know. You know? <laughs> All right. All right. Well, um, thank you for your time, and um, you have my number if you need me, and if you yep. any questions about advertising or anything else, you, um, you and Lou can get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you all. Really all right. Good luck it. and God bless. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Um, Damon, anything you want to say? Towards the end of the show, any, uh, you want to say or address anything else? Uh, no, not really, man. Y'all uh, y'all did a good job. Yo, Damien, watch watch the show. She answered a lot of great questions. I definitely will. I, I everything, definitely. everything from from um, you know, um well, social he, distancing, you know, the you know, uh, okay, just watch. He'll just watch it. He'll just watch it. <laughs> and this will be up on this will be on blackquestions.com later on tonight. Um with that, um that's it. I don't have right. the um I don't have the intro or the outro, Damon, so I guess we're just going to... Yeah, yeah, we can't. We can't what do you do, AJ? You could be anywhere. Come on, huh? do that. Oh, okay. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Well, thank you for everybody who's tuned in. Again, Eddie Johnson, Jamie Pesson, Alex Harrison, um, Gail Baxter, Shanice, uh, Sh Shanice Kellogg, um, Stephanie Swan. Um, there's a few other... Uh, Chris Scribner. Um, there was a few others I saw. Hector Santiago, Sandy Barnaby. I saw some other Luis Cherico. Yeah, everybody else who tuned in. Um, you could be doing anything else right now, but you decide to ride with us, and we greatly appreciate it. This is Black West Chester presents the People Before Politics Radio Show, episode two sixty one. Um, we're on every every Sunday um, from six to eight, um, or starting at six until whenever um <laughs> right now while we're doing the COVID thing um also check out our shows coming up david you want to plug uh one or two of the shows coming up um uh hold on a second this we is have... a lot of things going on okay so uh may 27th we have policing the black community part two yes um and if you missed part second. one it's on black yes. questions part one is on way up um and then um uh what's going on the next saturday um we having um michael lamont of michael lamont netwear on um health and wellness um saturdays he'll be talking about staying healthy um and and owning a business being an entrepreneur and owning a business michael lamont has one of the one of the baddest bow tie necktie oh, companies. The, oh my God, those, that's those the guy that you be putting on with the videos of the yes. neckties. Right. Yeah, those all baddest nice. bow ties that you see. Oh, oh, that's that's Mont. Michael Mont. Yeah. Nice. Um, and June fifth, we have part three, policing the black community. Um, and um, June twelfth, we have Freedom Friday with legendary radio host Bob Law from WLIB. And if you missed it um, yesterday was a uh, health, health and wellness Saturdays and they had a spiritual health dealer, uh, Reverend um, Jeffrey Wheeler, great conversation. Great, great, great. great. Very great conversation. Um, it, to the point that I, I was watching it and I was about to tune in and join, but it was so great. I didn't want to break up the flow and I just watched it. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't want to interrupt the flow. Like, I just like, it was like and um, if this past Monday, if you missed it, we had Modern Day Hero Monday. Lorraine um, Yonkers Strong, she gave four individuals a spotlight in Yonkers that's out there. They're not elected officials out there doing it. The next one, the next city we're going to be doing is New Rochelle. 
Nice. Um, try to knock that out and um, get lock that down within the next couple of Mondays. And then um, uh, Cliff, that was on um, the other day, and Damon are going to help me work on Greenberg. We do, we do Greenberg next, and um, we, we try to uh, you know highlight the unsung heroes in these communities that that are out there handing out the masks, doing the work. They 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 they're not you know you don't really they don't get credit usually. Some of the work they do, you see elected officials taking pictures for, but it's them that do the work or have provided the service that the elected official was cheesing um, and then taking pictures about. So we wanted to spotlight the people, put the people before the politics like the radio show. Um, so check that out. We got a lot in store. And um, me and Damon might just get on any given day and just address a topic, um, you know, COVID-19 check-in. Um, you never know. So tune in. Tune in blackwestchester.com for everything else. The May 15th issue, today's the 17th, will be up digitally in the next 48 hours or so. Um, and then you'll be able to see all of that. Um, last day to advertise, if anybody want to advertise in that paper. And um, then we're working on the June issue. So with that, that's it. Um, I'm out. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, um, Lorraine, for, for joining. Um, that's right. People haven't seen Lorraine in a while. Lorraine hasn't, except for the Monday show. Has not been on a lot of Sundays, so it was good to have you back. Um, thank you, thank you. Wish. I've been dealing with a, a couple of COVID people in my family. You yeah, ready? yeah. And shout out to Dr. Bob. He's uh in the lab working on something. Um, you know, always cooking something up. Um, working on some research paper or something. He wasn't able to make it today. So thank everybody who tuned in. Everybody who 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 um who holds us down as we enter our six six year anniversary coming up soon so uh, and thank you aj for oh, oh, always bringing us the news and for always being on point <laughs> thank you thank you to all the supporters behind the scenes too who uh you know don't don't want to remain nameless they make little donations just to help us keep going you greatly greatly have been appreciated and man, man that's what's been keeping us going that and the advertising and continues to help us bring you the news of the black point of view for free to the people be the voice of the voiceless. Uh, Damon, that's it. Uh, that's it. That's it. Uh, all right, we out. I'm ending it now. Uh, Please.